Bibles out then and we'll get into our study of what the scriptures say about the scriptures. I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Romans chapter 3. This is the second part. We'll try to make it the final part. This is the second part of our fourth lesson in Bible Basics. This one being on the scriptures. And we basically are giving you some statements about the Bible. These are very basic. But we're giving you statements about the Bible, and we're giving you verses from which we make those statements. Okay, And we said that the Bible is the infallible Word of God given to man by inspiration of God through the Holy Ghost. And we gave you, and we gave you verses. I had some of them written up here. I don't know I'll be able to get all of them on the board, but you will have these either printed out or the book, chapter, and verse numbers uh, given to you on your handout that we'll give you at the, at the close of the lesson. Then number two, we said the Bible has a higher place than anything else, including God's own name. I remember the first time that I read that verse, it shocked me. Number three, we said that the Bible was put in written form so that the believer can know what is and what is not the Word of God. When something is written down, you may have questions of interpretation, but at least we know exactly what is said when it's written down. Number four, God's Word has been perfectly preserved according to God's promise. And I believe that the Word of God is... that. By the way, the same God that can give His Word perfectly can keep it perfectly. And if He can't keep His Word, He certainly can't keep you. Because His Word was infallible. And you weren't infallible when you got saved. The same God that saved you can keep you for all eternity. And the same God that gave the book uh, uh, over a period of years from Genesis to Revelation can certainly keep it. As a matter of fact, uh, he said in Matthew 24, 35, your Savior said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And I'll say once again at the beginning of this lesson that I believe that the Bible is available today. 66 books preserved providentially, perfectly, as God would have you to have it, in this book I've got in my hand, which is an old King James Version. If somebody were to ask you what the preacher means when he talks about King James 1611, it's just the old King James Bible. It's available at the Dollar Tree for $1. Okay? Uh, you can go to a Christian bookstore and you can pay a couple hundred dollars if you want to. What you're paying for is the binding. <clears throat> I would suggest that if you want to get you a new Bible... I would suggest that you see Mrs. O'Neill. Mrs. O'Neill loves Bibles and she loves to order them. Because if she gets one in that you've ordered, she's going to take it out and she's going to smell it. <laughs> Handle it and feel it. She likes, she likes Bibles. But she can get you a good deal on a Bible if you want. But I refer to the Word of God as preserved in this old King James Version as the King James 1611 Authorized Version Bible. Authorized version was one of the things it was called, not because that uh, uh, King James authorized it, but because it became such an authority in the hearts and minds of the people after it came out. 1611 was the year in which it was translated. And your King James Bible, the spelling has uh, uh, been updated from those days. Anybody seen an old uh, copy of the Declaration of Independence? Uh, if you ever look at those, it'll take you a minute. You can do it, but it'll take you a minute to be able to figure out what's going on and, and read it. It's not like some of those things you see on Facebook where it says only 10% of the wisest people in the world can actually read what this is, you know, and they put it upside down or, or put symbols and things like that. But like uh, um, an S will look like an F on some of the old uh, English documents if you've seen the Declaration of Independence. But anyhow, that kind of thing may be updated. But it is not. What you have in your hand today is not a different version than the AB 1611. It is the authorized version of 1611 AD. And it's still saving souls. It's still blessing people's hearts uh, today. And that's where, the, that's where the Word of God is today as far as I am certain about. In other languages, I'm not as certain about. Uh, there are some that are probably better than others, but I believe this is perfect. Now, if you have Romans chapter 3, the next thing that we want to say is the Bible is the final authority in all matters. And if you've got Romans chapter 3, I'd like you to look, please, at verse 4. 
where the Bible says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. That is one of my theme verses, and it's part of my philosophy about life. If the Word of God says something, and the mayor says something else. If the Word of God says something, and your pastor says something else. If the Word of God says something, and your president contradicts it, and that point, my attitude is, let God be true, and every man a liar. Okay, I'll say this, and you may think I'm brave because Ms. O'Neill's not in here. But if the Word of God says something and Ms. O'Neill says something else, then God's Word is true, Ms. O'Neill's a liar. Okay, that's about the only way I get away with that, too. Um, the psalmist said, I esteem all thy sayings concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. The Psalm 119, 128. Uh, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. That's Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. I don't think I'm going to write these down here, but they are on your handout. The next thing I'd like you to turn to is Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 4. And the next statement we want to make is, is that while some uh, things in the Bible are more important than others, for instance, it's probably, it's probably agreeable to all of you for me to say that John 3.16 is an important verse. We all agree on that? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But I'll give you another verse I've memorized. Eber Peleg Ryu. That's 1 Chronicles 125. 1 Chronicles 125. It's the second shortest verse in the Bible. Eber Peleg Reu. And as you probably can guess, that's in the chronology where it tells who begat so and so and who begat so and so. That verse is the Word of God. Okay? It may not be as important as John 3.16. Does anybody know what we refer to when we refer to the most important doctrines of the Bible? It helps identify us as a church. You may have heard me identify our church or identify me by saying that I'm a Bible-believing. And the word refers to the more most important things in the Bible. Anybody got an idea what that word might be? The word is fundamental. Okay? If something is really basic and very important, uh, we call those things fundamentalists. Somebody who, who takes a strong stand for these things. We're talking about things like the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, blood redemption, okay, inspiration of Scripture, resurrection of Christ, things like that. Uh, those are fundamentals. And someone who stands on those things, separates from others who do not believe those things, and, uh, and maintains that those things are fundamental, that person is generally referred to as a fundamentalist. I call myself a Bible-believing, fundamental, independent Baptist. As a Bible-believing fundamentalist, I make a lot of noise about the fundamentals. But I believe every word. And if you're at Luke chapter 4, verse 4, our next statement is that every word of God is important. And Luke chapter 4, if you'll turn there, Jesus was talking to the devil at what we call the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 4, we have this statement. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I will mention to you that at the end of your lesson plan, you'll see some things here called reference books. All those are some titles of some little booklets I've written. They're $2 a piece. If you want one, see Mrs. O'Neill. One of them's called, Do We Have the Word of God? One's called, Read Your Bible Through. One is called, The Preservation of Scripture. One is called, How to Recognize a Bad Bible. Now, if you'll get um, one of those, except for the one on Read the Bible Through, they're about the Bible version issue. And on How to Recognize a Bad Bible, it'll point out that Luke 4.4 that you're looking at right now, in nearly every one of the new Bibles, they've taken Luke 4.4 and they stop it in the middle of the verse. In Luke 4.4, 4, the New International Version, New American Standard Bible, English Standard Version, just about every one of them, the Jehovah's False Witness Bible, the New World Translation, they say something like, 
uh, that is written that man should not live by bread alone. Period. That's how it stops. Nearly every one of them leaves out telling you what you're supposed to live by. And you're supposed to live by this book. Amen? Amen. This church is governed by this book. This pastor's home is governed by this book. Uh, your life should be governed by this book, and it should be guided by this book. It's written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, the next thing that we want to say is, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis. The next thing we want to say is, is that the devil attacks the word of God. He hates it. The Bible doesn't tell us why, but the first thing that he did in going from front to back in your Bible, in dealing with somebody was he questioned the wording and the truth of what God said. Matter of fact, something I'd like you to get a hold of in this Bible Basics class is what were the first uh, four words Yay, God that said. <clears throat> you can tell one of my Bible Institute students who's been an absentee by the way um, <clears throat> if you're there, you can underline them. But she's exactly right. And let's look at the verse. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman. Somebody tell me, who was that old serpent? The devil. The devil. Say Revelation 12, 9. We need a verse on that. Revelation 12, 9 identifies that old serpent as the devil. Say and he said unto the woman, get those four words there, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And then he got in conversation, and you know the rest, uh, how that we had the fall. There. 2 Corinthians 2.17, just, uh, uh, you don't have to turn there. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul said that we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Now the word of God is incorruptible. We find that in 1 Peter um, I believe it is. 123. And the word of God is incorruptible seed. It liveth and abideth forever. And so how can you corrupt something that is incorruptible? Well, the way that you can corrupt it is by a counterfeit. And the devil attacks by counterfeiting or imitating the word of God. And if you get that little booklet on how to recognize a bad Bible, you'll see. I don't believe that the King James Bible is the best in a line of Bibles that, that kind of go like this and, and that this one's the best, even though it may have some need for improvement. I believe this Bible is the Bible. I believe this is perfect. And all the rest are imitations. Now, I've got uh, a bunch of other Bibles. I've got them back here. I'll show you where they are. I never recommend them to anybody. I never use them. Say, preacher, what do you got them for? I have those Bibles to show you how wrong they are. I have those Bibles to be able to show you by opening them up. And, for instance, take Luke 4.4 4 and show you how that all those new Bibles correct, corrupt the Word of God by removing the second half of Luke 4.4. 4. All right, the next statement we want to make is, is that the Bible should be read, studied, and searched. Uh, one verse I would like you to get a hold of. Let's uh, see if you can turn there. It's toward the book of Revelation. It's 2 Timothy. I'd like you to turn, please, to 2 Timothy. The Bible should be read, studied, and searched. One of the reference books that we've got listed at the conclusion of your lesson plan is a little book that I've written called Read Your Bible Through. You can't study without reading. I recommend... <coughs> that in addition to any other study you do, you read your Bible through from cover to cover, and I recommend you do it once a year. And when I say that, I say that as a minimum. I say that I'd encourage you to read your Bible through once a year. And every member of this class, we got a good group here this morning, every member of this class, 10 years from now, Jesus tarries, every member of this class would be stronger Christians if with the right attitude, and that concludes an attitude of obedience, and submission. But with the right attitude, if you're saved, every last one of you, 10 years from now, 
should be better Bible students, probably able to teach other people the Bible, if you would get into your Bible and read it every day. And Ms. O'Neill reads her Bible through now three times a year. I've been reading my Bible through three times a year for some time. Just finished it the 111th time. No, I do not know all the Bible. No, I do not have all the Bible memorized. I do not claim to be a Bible expert. There are things that, that if you were to ask me about the Bible, I'd draw a complete blank. I'd just say, I've got to study. I'll have to do some research. And there's some things I'm not really interested in keeping in my memory. As a matter of fact, I kind of do that Eber P. Leg Ryu is just as a kind of a humorous thing to show you that there's verses you'll never pay attention to. But, um, uh, but I do read the Bible, and I do study the Bible. But <clears throat> if you have 2 Timothy 2.15, in addition to reading the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15, written by a preacher to a preacher, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, the word of truth. So the Bible needs to be studied and it needs to be rightly divided. I will mention we have Bible Institute classes which are basically Saturday afternoon classes held right here in this room from 4 to 7. We have four classes. They last approximately a year where we probably will get done around the end of August with the classes that we're going right now. And probably start up in September with a new year, probably. Just, you know, my estimates about finishing and starting with regard to me teaching and preaching uh, don't always come out to be so accurate. But uh, when we start up next year, one of the things that we plan to study is mentioned in this verse. And that is rightly dividing the word of truth. One of the four courses, they're 45 minutes each. You can come, by the way, there's no charge. You can come. And you can stay for one class, you can stay for all four classes. You can stay after class if you don't sit around after class. But uh, from four to seven on Saturdays, and next year we'll be studying, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is a good verse to memorize. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Would you take your Bibles now, please, and turn to Psalms 119. Psalm 119. Next thing we want to say about the Word of God is that the Holy Ghost will give you an understanding of the Bible through the Bible itself. That's done by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And Jesus' words are spirit, according to John 6, 63. And so, if you'll read your Bible, read it with a submissive heart. Psalm 119. If you open your Bible down the middle, you'll be pretty close to Psalms. Open your Bible right down the middle. You should be pretty close to Psalms. If uh, you have trouble finding it, you probably got an index in the beginning of your Bible. But don't wait too long because we'll be going on to the next point. But Psalm 119, verse 130. If you have it, you can look at it. I claim this verse. I love this verse because I don't claim to be super smart. If I learn something, I learn something not because I have a photographic memory. Or as one fellow said, he had a photogenic memory. I guess it could look good. But I don't have a photographic memory. Uh, if I went to your house once, I probably used my GPS to get there the second time. Okay? Uh, it takes me a while to learn something. If you, if you find that I quote scripture, it's because I've said them over and over and over and over. And that's all. So I like to quote this verse to myself. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. Do you see that, 130? The entrance of thy words giveth light. That is, as you read the Bible, God will... It won't all happen at once. Okay, you're not going to learn the Bible first time you read one verse. But God will, by the Holy Spirit, open up your understanding by you allowing the Word of God to come in. That's particularly if you have a desire to do the will of God. The, the entrance of thy words uh, giveth light. It giveth understanding to who? Unto the simple. So if you say, preacher, I don't, I don't know where the books of the Bible are. I don't know the basic doctrines. Uh, what I do, read your Bible. Just start out reading it. And I'll tell you one thing that it'll... That'll do, well, I'll wait on that because we're going to say that in just a minute. 
Uh, if you're in Psalm 119, 130, I want you to look down to a verse that, that is pretty well known by uh, Christian people who've been saved for some time, and that's verse number 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. The Bible gives direction in life. And Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if you'll read the Bible, it'll tell you all kinds of things. You know, people ask questions about things. The only thing that really matters is to have either a clear statement or a pretty good principle set forth in the Bible. My opinion means nothing. Your opinion means nothing. Somebody says, is this wrong? Doesn't matter what my opinion is. You need to find out what God's opinion is. Because God's opinion is the truth. Okay? It's not just what he thinks. What he thinks is true. Everything he says is true. So, uh, the Bible will give you direction in life. Take your Bibles and look in the New Testament, please. Again, you're going to be pretty close to the book of Revelation. I want you to try to find 1 Peter chapter 2. If you can find Hebrews as you thumb through going to Revelation, it's uh, just past Hebrews. You've got Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at one verse there to back up this statement. And that is, the Bible helps the believer to grow. If you want to be a growing Christian, listen to me. This is so important. I want every one of you to be a successful Christian. And if you want to be a growing Christian, this is not talking about whether or not you're going to hell or not. If you, got, if you trusted Christ as your Savior, you're saved. Even if you don't act like it and can't convince anybody you're saved, if you trusted Christ as your Savior, you're saved. There are consequences for sin. I've got a whole little booklet on that, what happens when Christians sin. There are, there are consequences when Christians sin. But, but if you're even a poor Christian, you're, if you're trusted Christ, you're saved. But one of my burdens as a pastor and as a Christian is not only to win people to Christ, but to encourage Christians to grow. And one of the main things that's going to help you to grow is this book. And if you neglect this book, you're not going to grow like you should. There are people who are at the same level of maturity in the Lord and in His Word now as they were 30 years ago. I'm talking about Christians who have been saved for a while. And they've not budged. They've not moved. Uh, they've been saved this time, but they know just about as much as they knew 30 years ago, which isn't saying much, okay? And they, and they, they don't know where the books are. They don't know what the verses say. They don't have any verses committed to memory. Uh, they couldn't tell you why they do things in their life because they don't know what the Bible says about it. They just think it's the thing to do. But the Bible will help you grow. If you have 1 Peter chapter 2 now, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 gives you this great principle. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Be like a baby. A baby, unless something's wrong with it, a baby is hungry. Okay? Baby may not know how to walk, but it knows how to let you know it's hungry. Okay? And if you're saved, you ought to have a hunger for the word of God. One of the things that makes me feel like somebody probably is saved is when they come to a church like ours and they hear the Word of God and they say, wow, this is what I need. Okay, uh, That indicates to me that you know the Lord. You're a babe in Christ because this is the food and the fuel that God has for the believer. Now the next thing I want you to turn, please, to the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, turn to John and go to John chapter 15. Next thing I want to say is is that the Bible will help you be clean. And that's one of the main reasons why I recommend you read the Bible every day. Is you will be a better Christian just by the holiness of the Word of God coming in you. They say you are what you eat. Well, if you eat a bunch of garbage, that's what you are. <laughs> you, you become it. It, has a, it rubs off on you. It has an effect on you. Uh, when I used to, when I used to do pumping iron years ago, um, they would they would refer to different things that you would eat, and if you ate it, it caused these results. Whether it be energy, 
or whether it be muscle, or whether it be just turning into lard, okay? And a lot of it had to do with what you ate. Anybody know what a person eats for, for uh, uh, muscle? What, what ingredient in your food that you want to be sure is in there? Protein. Um, now, carbohydrates primarily for energy. Fat, you can get energy off of that too, but you have to be careful. But if you want to be holy, John 15, 3, Jesus said, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You'll have some additional verses on your handout. You will need to read those verses in order to answer some of the questions that we're going to give. All right, the last thing, if you'll take your Bibles, please, and turn to Ephesians. If you're in John, you got after that, you got Acts, Romans, then you got 1st and 2nd Corinthians, then there's Galatians, then there's Ephesians. We're going to go to Ephesians. So if you're in John, you got Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, then Ephesians. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6. This is our last statement we want to make before we close up give you handouts. And that is, the Bible is your one offensive weapon listed in the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, according to Hebrews 4.12. If you didn't get any of these verses written down, you try to take notes. I promise you, we're going to dismiss in a moment. And... Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll actually probably forward dismiss. We'll give everybody the handout. You'll have these verses and more. Ephesians 6, 17. If you got it, chapter 6 of Ephesians, right after Galatians. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword, that's, that's the only offensive weapon in the list, beginning with verse 10 talking about being strong to fight the battle that the Lord has for you against the spiritual wickedness in this world. Uh, the one offensive weapon, the armor's got a lot of defensive stuff. The one offensive weapon is in verse 17, and that is the Word of God. Let me give you these and let you take them home. Matter of fact, can I have some help here? Matthew, you might help me. Preacher. You're a blessing. Preacher. You can stop. Um,